Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming. I'm Margaret Mims from the Department of Learning and Interpretation here at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. Today, we celebrate the opening of the exhibition Jasper Johns, 100 Variations on a Theme. The exhibition features 100 unique prints Jasper Johns made in 2015 over the course of 10 days in his Connecticut studio. To introduce us to the extraordinary series featured in the exhibition Jasper Johns, 100 Variations on a Theme, to tell us why each impression is unique and it cannot be replicated, and to detail for us how the series continues and expands the recurring themes of Jasper John's work. I'm delighted this afternoon to welcome Dr. Dina Woodall as our speaker. Dr. Woodall is Associate Curator of Prints and Drawings here at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston and is the curator who organized the exhibition Jasper John's 100 Variations on a Theme. Dr. Woodall joined the staff of the Museum of Fine Arts Houston in 2008 after working in the Prints and Drawings Department at the Cleveland Museum of Art and in the European Art Department at the Nelson Adkins Museum of Art in Kansas City. Here in Houston, the then museum director, Peter Marzio, tasked her with building a collection of old master drawings, a task which Dr. Woodall has pursued with enthusiasm, a specialist eye, and an amazing depth of knowledge in the history of art ever since. Today, she oversees a large and varied collection of over 10,000 drawings, watercolors, prints, artist books, and print matrices that span the time period from the mi medieval period, from the midi Middle Ages until the present day, and she maintains a very active exhibition schedule on top of that. Dr. Woodall has organized numerous exhibitions and written essays for their accompanying publications during her time here at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. For example, right now, and I hope all of you will see this today in addition to the Jasper Johns exhibition, Dr. Woodall has not only organized Jasper Johns, but also the exhibition I'm a Hog and Modernism, which is currently on view in the first level of the museum's Audrey Jones Beck Building. Here in Houston, of course, I think all of us know I'm a Hog for donating her home, Bayou Bend Collection and Gardens, and her collection of early American decorative arts to the Museum of Fine Arts Houston in 1957. But what you may not know is that Ima Hogg was one of the first collectors in Texas of prints and drawings by avant-garde European and American artists of the early 20th century. And so the exhibition Dr. Woodall has organized celebrates the 80th anniversary of Ima Hogg's first major gift of these modern prints and drawings to the museum in 1939, a donation that Ima Hogg would continue throughout the 1940s. So again, if you haven't seen this exhibition, please be sure and see it today along with Jasper Johns. It will be on view through November the 3rd. Every year that Dr. Woodhull has been on staff here at the museum, she's organized or co-organized a major exhibition, bringing prints and drawings into the limelight at every opportunity. Just to name a couple of the most recent ones that all of you will know, earlier this year, she curated the prints and drawings included in the blockbuster exhibition, Vincent Van Gogh, His Life in Art. And last year was co-curator of the exhibition Michelangelo and the Vatican, Masterworks from the Capodimonte Museum in Naples. So I asked Dr. Woodall, well, what's up next for you? What are you working on? She said, well, I think all of you see or you drive by every day the new Nancy and Rich Kinder building, which is rising across the street from this building, where we'll have, that building will have a gallery dedicated for prints and drawings. And so Dr. Woodall's main focus at present is thinking about the inaugural rotations of works from, that, from her 10,000 prints and drawings, uh, what will be on view in the first year of the uh, Nancy and Rich Kinder Building. But this afternoon, she explores Jasper John's Catalog Raisonné project and how the series continues and expands the recurring themes of Jasper John's work. So please give her a very nice welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, thanks for being here this Sunday afternoon. 
Um, and if you want to explore more about prints and drawings in the future, we have a patron group here, now our 10th anniversary. It's called Art Plus Paper, and you could look it up on our website. The exhibition, Jasper John's 100 Variations on a Theme, debuts, really, it's the first time that these works have ever been shown. Um, it's a series of 100 unique prints that Jasper Johns made in 2015 over the course of 10 days in his Connecticut studio. The show anticipates and honors his 90th birthday in 2020, and the show goes through February, so we are going to be able to connect with that, that uh, 2020 date. In this lecture, I will delve into the making of this dynamic print series and contextualize it as we explore how Johns reuses iconic motifs and challenges the possibilities of printmaking, drawing, and painting. Jasper Johns was born in Augusta, Georgia, and raised in South Carolina. He began drawing at a young age and always wanted to become an artist. He attended the University of South Carolina at Columbia and then took art classes at Parsons School of Design in New York before serving in the Army during the Korean War. In 1953, Johns permanently moved to New York, uh, belonging to a close group of friends, including the artist and fellow Southerner Robert Rauschenberg, the composer and artist John Cage, as well as the choreographer Merce Cunningham. In 1954, Johns began to paint flags, targets, the alphabet, and other recognizable objects, um, creating a visual vocabulary that has reappeared in his art for about six decades. At a time when abstract styles of painting were considered the most avant-garde, John selected ordinary objects as his subject matter. He commented that they were things the mind already knows. And his direction was a radical departure that quickly established him as one of America's most influential artists. He pulled away from abstract expressionism, accentuating conscious control rather than impulsiveness, and invented a new style that prompted uh, such ensuing art movements as pop, minimalism, and conceptual art. John's approaches his paintings, drawings, sculpture, and prints with equal seriousness and intensity, and he evolves these same themes for years or even decades, always shifting the focus of his pictorial and intellectual concerns. He noted, I like to repeat an image in another medium to observe the play between the two, the image and the medium. The Museum of Fine Arts Houston has been collecting John's work for many years, and the former print curator here and my former boss, Barry Walker, uh, recognized, as he said, perhaps more than any other artist in the history of Western art, it makes the greatest sense to collect John's work by theme. And we have acquired the artist's work um, in this manner, including a group of drawings and prints that John's made in the 1980s and 90s on the left, connected to his monumental painting, Untitled Red, Yellow, Blue, on the right, that was completed in 1984. They take on a pivotal role in the exhibition, richly confirming how Johns uh, was deeply interested in how each medium affected the pictorial presence. While traditionally one thinks uh, that the logical progression in an artist's working process is to make preparatory drawings, then a painting, and after prints, John's upends this standard progression of media. Untitled red, yellow, and blue on the left was not first fully realized in painted form. Its evolution followed a different pathway. The genius of this monumental painting began with the, an etching dating to 1979. He made Land's End a three-plate color etching on your right, in which he reinterpreted a 1963 painting of the same title. He then reworked the original black plate of the color etching Land's End on the left for Land's End 2, the black and white print in the center, followed by a finished working drawing on the right. One of the only occurrences of this type of drawing on this scale in his career. From here, he went back to the print medium for further experimentation. He became deeply interested in the components of his previous work, and in 1982, he reworked each plate and printed them as three separate etchings. Soon after, 
He made three paintings based on these prints, each the same size, untitled red, untitled yellow, and untitled blue, completing the three of them in 1984. And they intrigued him, and he kept them in his St. Martin's home for further study. Over the period of several years, he gradually moved these three paintings closer together until they were indeed one three-part unit in 1996, as you see here. So if you go into the exhibition, look really close, you'll see how he brought these three together. And then Johns also rethought the image in print form, which as you can see, he takes every bit as seriously as his paintings. Johns reworked the printing surfaces, sometimes after a number of years, and he also rearranged the printed panels, further pushing the limits of his ideas. Johns made a set of 16 stunning trial proofs, exhausting all of the possible color combinations. And we have these two prints on view in the exhibition. He produced many electric colors in these trial proofs, um, as on the left, and, and with the use of secondary colors, such as the green and purple on the sides of the triptych. And that's actually an orange hand um, attached to an arm, uh, a yellow arm that thrusts upward. As Richard Field has commented, John's paintings, drawings, and prints rarely function singly, con confining and circumscribing their meanings, but form potentially endless chains of interconnected images. A print is a work of art consisting of ink on paper, which typically exist in multiple. Each individual print is known as an impression, and their images are always mediated by a, a horde of variables and by the assorted dialectics of printmaking. The image is not directly drawn on paper, but rather the artist creates a composition on a matrix, such as a metal plate, a lithographic stone, or a wood block, that can be transferred to a sheet of paper by inking and running it through a printing press. For Johns, he says, printmaking encourages ideas because of the lapse of time involved in the process. The medium itself suggests things changed or left out. Just to get you um, sort of in a better understanding, uh, the Museum of Modern Art has this incredible, uh, fan fantastic, really um, interactive that, that helps you understand the various printmaking processes. And, and just as a refresher, I kind of wanted to walk you through the etching process because it will make more sense um, later. If you click on each one, what is, a, what is a print and then etching, or what is a print then a screen print, or woodcut, or litho, they tend to show you these diagrams, and the, the brush here would have actually moved, but I just screenshot all of them. So this one, um, you would apply a ground or an acid-resistant coating onto uh, the, the metal plate. And then you would draw the image um, and, and literally scrape through the ground in order to reach um, the metal and you would see the metal there like in the elephant. And then you would drop it into an acid bath and as you can see the bubbles from the acid are eating away where the metal is exposed. And then you would remove the ground, the acid resistant coating that's on top. And then you would ink the plate. You would normally remove all of the ink that's on the surface leaving just the lines that are, are etched into the plate. And then you would print it. And there you see the finished print, which is often it is in reverse. As a renowned, inventive, and prolific printmaker, Johns has worked with every printmaking technique, exploring the specific capabilities of each method. And like Picasso, he is one of the most important painter gravures of the 20th century, and certainly the greatest living printmaker that we have today. Johns was instrumental in nurturing the American print renaissance in the 1960s and 1970s. The artist is obsessed with the repetition of images in changing contexts, a fixation perfectly aligned with the capabilities of printmaking. As you have seen, Johns recycles many of his matrices, incorporating them into new compositions. If it, has, if, if it had been possible um, over the years, um, Johns would have kept all of his printmaking matrices, 
such as the etching plates and lithographic stones that he ever used. But he comments that that wasn't po possible, un unfortunately. And, and he's really jealous of the uh, Norwegian expressionist artist um, who influenced him, as, actually, Edvard Munch, who he really admires and was able to keep all of his matrices. And they're uh, still um, accessible and in, the, uh, in a museum in Oslo, his museum. Johns recalls his first experience in 1954 with making a print. He said, while working as a clerk in a bookstore, I folded a small piece of paper, made parallel cuts into it, then applied ink and pressed it against another sheet of paper, leaving an impression of the ink. Two years after his breakthrough ex exhibition at Leo Castelli's gallery in New York, Johns was introduced officially in 1960 to printmaking, specifically lithography, at the behest of Tatiana Grossman, the Russian emigre founder of Universal Limited Art Editions Press on the left. Johns started with lithographs, working with the master printer, Zygmunt Pride. His first lithographic series was of the numerals zero to nine. Numerals would become the most prevalent motif in Johns' work. The complete numerical series, zero to nine, is ordered into two rows of five digits apiece at the top of each print. Whereas beneath this double row, one digit at a time is singled out for scrutiny. The portfolio of 10 lithographs each was made in three variations, using varied papers and printed in black, in gray, and in colors. And we have the gray series in the exhibition. Johns used a single stone to print the zero to nine series, and while he erased most of each, each number before drawing the next, a trace of the previous number appears in the successive numeral print, retaining the evolution of the stone's image and the captivating combination of something that, as you will see, he continues to respond to in his oeuvre, specifically in the catalog raisonné series, that of permanence and change. Here, the predetermined numerical and visual pattern is balanced by alterations of shapes, contours, and values made by the artist's hand. In 1967, Johns expanded his repertoire to etching, such as Target One at the graphic workshop ULAE. Initially, he disliked etching, but after many trials, found it a particularly useful medium as an exercise in visual representation and memory. He once said, for me, the most inter interesting thing about etching is the ability of the copper plate to store multiple layers of information. One can work in one way on a plate, later work in another way, and the print can show these different times in one moment. He mastered screen print and etching in the 1970s. In 1974, Johns went to work in the etching medium with Aldo Cromlink in Paris. Um, on the upper left, you can see him, who is also known uh, as the master printer to Picasso. And many people during this time period went to, to work with uh, Picasso's master printer. Johns learned to manipulate tonal range and textural qualities available in Aquatint. Uh, while etching focuses online, Aquatint is a variant of etching and used in tandem with it to produce areas of tone and hence the name aqua tent or watercolor, the watercolor version in the print medium. Johns continued to explore printmaking with other printmaking workshops and their master printers in the United States, such as Bill Goldston at ULAE, Ken Tyler, who appears on the screen um, at Gemini GEL in Los Angeles, and Hiroshi Kawanashi, Kawanishi at Simca Print Artist in New York City. In 1995, John set up his own printmaking studio in an old barn near his home on his Connecticut property. And in 1996, he invited the master printer, John Lund, formerly of Universal Limited Art Editions, to work with him full time. John's placed the print studio across the hall from his painting studio. Uh, this situation enabled him to interchangeably work between the painting and print media in an expediency not possible when the artist had to travel to a graphic workshop in a different location to pull prints with a master printer. So his removal 
from the social environment of the big print studios allowed him to work on his prints much in the same way as his paintings, in more solitude and more at will, gaining the opportunity of a higher degree of experimentation in printmaking, as seen by the 100 catalog raisonne monoprints in the exhibition. Though printmaking is known for its ability to make repeatable images, the monotype and monoprint methods are characterized by their, sing by their singularity and often considered hybrids between painting or drawing and print. Their history dates back to the Renaissance and they resurged in the 19th and later 20th centuries. The monotype is typically made by applying such materials as paint, viscous ink, watercolor, and crayon on a smooth, non-absorbent, unmarked, not incised um, metal or plastic plate, while the monoprint utilizes a matrix with fixed, repeatable, carved, etched, or engraved lines. Monoprints and monotypes are spontaneous, immediate, improvisational, gestural, expressive, and unpredictable. The resulting prints are unique as each time an image is printed, only one strong impression is created, making exact replication impossible. As Jennifer Roberts has commented, it's a space for rapid, intense experimentation. The matrix is essentially destroyed in the process of creation. It's like life. There's no fantasy you can keep creating this image. There's something haunting. Jaunt has made more than 200 prints of the monoprint and monotype variety. The artist places monoprints and monotypes in the same category due to their hybridity and variability in printing, although they are technically different from one another. Johns has remarked, at its simplest, it is as easy as leaving a fingerprint. Monoprints sometimes come as afterthoughts following some project, he says. I suppose that each medium or technique offers an appeal of its own. One jumps in and, if lucky, finds ways to proceed. And here are the first 10 mo unique monoprints in the Catalog Raisonne series. Printmaking has often been thought of as synonymous only with its ability to exactly replicate a pictorial statement, an idea that limits its infinite possibilities. Rather, printmaking should be linked to a place. Um, it should be linked to its basic physical and spatial operations, primarily as an arena for exploring contact, transfer, reversal, rotation, pressure, absorption, and resistance. John's use of these essentially printerly operations like contact and reversal are what fascinates him about the printmaking media. And he extends these printmaking maneuvers to his work in other techniques such as painting. John's began exploring monotypes and monoprints in 1978 Working with these modes emerged from his work in lithography, the planographic method of using smooth, non-absorbent stones or plates that have qualities like the monoprint and monotype um, of ease for fluid mark making and simple alteration of the matrix. The appealing characteristics of transfer and variability for Johns were already seen earlier with his first lithographic project of the portfolio 0 to 9 from 1960 to 63 on view in the exhibition, where he explored sequential variations as he made progressive changes of each numeral from a single stone. He made three formative monoprint uh, sequences in the late 1970s and early 1980s, featuring his sovereign can and crosshatch motifs. These signature motifs are used throughout his career. The sovereign motif is of a sovereign coffee tin uh, full of used brushes, a surrogate for the persona of the artist and his working life. The hatching marks, slanted lines on the diagonal that form a kind of patchwork quilt whose patches are differentiated by the color and line direction of the hat strokes they uh, contain were influenced by a pattern seen painted on a car that passed by him on the Long Island Expressway and denote continuity and change in and of themselves. 
His first move into the arena of monoprints was accomplished using lithographic plates, and it was an experiment in pushing the metamorphic capacity of the lithographic plate to a new extreme, bringing variation down to the level of the single impression rather than the single edition. In his first 1978 series of 14 monoprints, he used three aluminum plates originally prepared for his lithographic print, Savern can, and brushes, as seen here on the left, with the gray-black background, and it can be considered as the precise, repeatable pictorial statement. This lithographic image was added to by non-unrepeatable marks, as in his first monoprint of the small Savern series to the right. In another rendition, two bands of strong greenish-blue ink are expressively laid down with a palette knife and squashed on the edges by the power of the press. His blood-red handprint in the center of the composition lays over the lithographically printed Savern can with paintbrushes, a type of symbiosis between the artist and his tools. It exerts the immediacy of the monoprint process and the uniqueness with the artist's own hand and therefore individual presence. Yet the artist's presence is still distanced since it is a print, for by pressing his inked hand on the metal plate and the use of the printing press to imprint it on paper, the artist's presence is mediated. This is quite appropriate for an artist who has wanted to depersonalize his mark making and actually counter the autographic mark. John said once, I want image to free themselves from me. In the monoprint and monotype processes, uh, the press becomes more empowered. For in making a print edition, the press must provide the ability to ensure consistency in printing from one impression to another in an edition. However, as Jennifer Rob Roberts suggests, it is also a metamorphic agent, for it introduces change to the image on the paper. The drawn or painted image on the matrix is volatile. The press alters the image as it applies pressure and transfers ink without the control of the artist. Note again the splotches on the ends of the inked columns on the sheet caused by the press. The ULE AE master printer Bill Goldston uh, calls the printmaking press, in this case, a drawing instrument. In this monoprint series, he inked the etched plate in black, and then enhanced each image with color additions. Some of his handwork was extensive, nuanced and layered, obscuring the repeatable image below. This slide gives you an indication of the distinctions within this monoprint series. The large Savarin coffee can lithograph from 1977 to 81 that is on view in the exhibition was based on his 1960 life-size sculpture, Painted Bronze. It has the symbolic tools of the artist in the coffee can with a predella that contains John's hand and forearm with the initials EM, a direct reference to the Norwegian expressionist painter Edvard Munch's self-portrait from 1895. It is set against a crosshatch pattern of gray and black like Grisai, a historic painting technique that mimics sculpture. He originally created the lithograph of the Savern can for a poster seen a few minutes earlier, announcing a retrospective of his work at the Whitney Museum in New York, and used the plates from the first print run to create a new variation on the subject, completed in 1981. A group of 33 proofs, that is, impressions taken during the printmaking process to see the current printing state of a plate while the plate is being worked on by the artist, were made and rejected for the initial project. In 1982, Johns used these proofs of the Savarin lithograph as his guide to make a series of unique prints. Johns painted on surfaces such as paper or plastic plates, placing the image face down on top of one of Savarin, the Savarin lithographs and running the sheet through a press. They showcase Johns' inventiveness. and the monoprint medium. Working directly over the original matrix to one, is one way of experimenting or playing with difference. 
different kinds of refinement, accent, tone, playful variations, John said in reviewing them, the viewer becomes sensitized to the differences through the repetition of the same. While many of the 30 unique prints in this series utilize the repeatable image of the Saverin lithograph as monoprints, John's went rogue on seven of them. He used permanent marker to trace the lithographic Saverin image onto a clear acrylic sheet and then flipped it over and used his tracing as a template for applying his painterly additions. They were printed on blank sheets of paper instead of over the Saverin lithographs as seen before, which makes these seven monotypes in the pure sense because no part of their, their impressions were printed from a re reproducible matrix. Roberts commented on the complex, almost labyrinth trajectory of John's prints. You can see the way a monotype is about not just the artist creating images, but images begetting images. John's would paint one, then print the print. There would still be a little material left. He would add to that print again, and you can really see the evolution. In doing so, without the foundational structure of the lithograph, the objects, such as the handles of the brushes, uh, lose their outlines and abstract strokes of ink meld into the background of hatch marks. The handprint and arm in the predella are now gone. Some of the elements in the Saverin series continued to be renewed in the 2015 catalog Raisonne series, such as the use of a predella and the artist's hand. He did not have a large production of uh, this monoprint monotype category in the 1990s. One such grouping of three monoprints is the first time he introduced plant leaves in his work. They are from 1998, and it is a surprising motif that will become pr prominent in the 100 catalog Raisonne series of 2015. Johns is known for using man-made objects, flags, numerals, targets in his oeuvre, and here he fundamentally changed. He made a nature print. It was intended as a gift for the artist Cleve Gray on his 80th birthday in 1998, and one print one print was given to his friend, and the other two impressions for John's own collection. They are direct prints from a large catalpa uh, leaf that was covered in green ink and run through the press. On either side of the leaf's central rib are the numbers eight and zero for his friend's birthday, and printed from small plates that remained from a 1975 edition of numeral etchings. Though organic instead of man-made, the particulars of the leaf with its extended veins uh, compare well to the compositional elements already in John's work, such as the diagonal cross hatches and flagstone-like units. The leaves can in themselves be considered relief plates and have the ability of printing in multiple, though few. In the last 17 years, Johns has had an intense period of production, creating multiple print series with both familiar and fresh subjects. Prints, due to their process, express the history of thought and action inherent in their creation and align with John's captivation with visual memory and the evolutionary process of image making. The 100 monoprints of the 2015 catalog Raisonne series perfectly demonstrates his ongoing commitment to visual memory, renewing consistent motifs from print to print linked in a chain of succession. As mentioned previously, over the course of 10 days in September 2015, Jasper Johns created this series of 100 monoprints in his Connecticut studio. The series was originally to be integrated into a deluxe five volume catalog raisonne, and in English that would be sort of a, kind of translated as reasoned catalog um, of an, an artist entire painted, of his entire painted and sculptural oeuvre from 1954 to 2014, documenting 355 paintings and 86 sculptures that was to be produced by the Wildenstein Plattner Institute of 2017. On the screen, you see the non-deluxe version that, that came to fruition that was, in fact, printed and published in 2017. The deluxe 
uh, addition only was supposed to be of 100, uh, was not realized. But he was planning on including one print with each deluxe edition. And when you look at them in the exhibition, you will see that they are at the right size, that they could have been insult, inserted into the front, behind the front cover of uh, the, the deluxe edition or the first volume of the deluxe edition. Yet the, the, the series here um, remains permanently connected and linked to the abandoned catalog raisonné series, uh, the catalog raisonné project with the words raisonné and intermittently catalog at the edge of each sheet. The, the often cited dictum from John's notebook, take an object, do something to it, do something else to it, is fully realized in this series as each successive print emerges as a variation on a theme. Collectively, the monoprints become a subtle essay on change, emphasizing John's dedication to the process of transformation, redefinition, and metamorphosis. John's began the project by starting with one of his intaglio plates used in the creation of his related tin color etching uh, within from 2007, which is on view in the exhibition, and revealing John's signature cross-hatched imagery covered by a layer of the color gray. The original image has been relatively obliterated by the time John's reused the plate for the 100 monoprints because the plate was cut down to a smaller size and then he reworked the action plate 11 times before continuing with the monoprints process. First he etched his hand and the symbols of the American Sign Language. Then in the second state he obliterated the image only to reintroduce his handprint and the word and gestures in the third state. In subsequent states, he adjusted the shading of the hand and added more imagery, uh, such as a faint uh, horizontally positioned broad leaf, normally in the top register. When Johns was satisfied with the base image, his master printer, John Lund, inked the etch plate and the artist added more motifs and nimbly applied ink, more ink in to further vary the series. The previous imagery from the etching within remains only as a palimpsest. John's then progressed making one unique print after another, morphing them uh, 100 different times in a narrative chain. And when you start looking at them and going through the exhibition, you almost see that sometimes uh, the first prints are a little bit calmer. The, the, the imagery is more positioned in a sort of more um, um, pose position. And then as you move through and look at all of them in a series, I feel like there's some sort of like crescendo happening and then decrescendo uh, towards the end. John's thought process is visibly at work in the sequential viewing of the 100 unique prints and demonstrates John's infinite repeatability. With John's, there is no one answer and no final solution. Constant, faithful Johnsian objects, the artist's handprint, stenciled letters and numbers and string, along with his use of the mirror reversal, are reintroduced in this series that were seen in earlier works in the artist's career. Drawing with ink on his fingers, he also adds his collected leaves and more handprints. John's handprints were introduced in the 1960s as a physical and personal representation. He imprinted his own hands as well as other body parts onto canvases, drawings, and prints. He used greasy materials, oil and soap, to imprint his hands, arm, and even face on the lithographic stone in hand, skin, with O'Hara poem, and Hatteras. In the Land's End etchings, precursors to the imagery in Untitled Red, Yellow, Blue that are in the exhibition, the motif of the outstretched arm previously referenced a drowning man uh, that is also indicated by the arrow that points downward but he eventually removed the ominous mood and the focus became the arm as the drawing instrument and the artist's presence. In the catalog Raisonné series, the artist's steady open palm hand commands each sheet, yet at times he covers it with ink or a leaf, turns it upside down. Additional handprints creep on the page, 
or the authorial mark is mirrored. Earlier in John's career, he promoted the letters of the alphabet and the numerals zero through nine. The letters and numeral of decimal notation represent civilization as they create order in the world and the tools of literacy. As seen earlier with zero to nine uh, at the outset of his career in the 1960s, John's returns again and again in the last uh, many decades to this element. They reappear individually in sequences and in grids. In the 2015 Catalog Raisonné series, they contain a purpose to number the sheets from one to 100. Yet the stenciled number, numerals are not stagnant, for they jump around the sheet. They are presented in white, gray, black, gridded, or in silhouettes. At times, they are all alone or placed on top of a leaf or a square like a calling card. This use of numerals follows another project from 2012 in which John's produced 62 numbered monoprints, which was the first time he used them as the subject in the unique prints. In both cases, similar devices are employed, varied inking and collage-like combinations of stencils with other materials added to the plates, such as string and screens. Sign language gestures emerge and are inserted into these numerals. Uh, American Sign Language takes on an even stronger role, as you will see in the catalog Raisonné series to come. The use of letters of the alphabet also extends throughout John's long artistic career. In gray alphabet from 1968 on the left, the lithograph is composed of tones of gray. The stencil pattern letters are ephemeral, drifting in and out of focus. Placed on, in a grid, the letters within rectangular shapes recall wooden blocks uh, used by children or a printer's pr letter press, hinting at their function as the building blocks of language and therefore knowledge. Words made up of letters are key in the untitled red, yellow, blue series, as they serve not only as legible ideas, but also used as directional signage, changing the movement of the surface. In the 2015 catalog Raisonné series, stenciled letters are used for the words Raisonné and occasionally catalog. There are three places in the exhibition where you can see catalog, so I encourage you to go find them. And they serve as the purpose of introducing the series itself. The words are sometimes more legible than other times on the successive sheets. The word raisonné, most often in the lower register of each sheet, is accompanied by the gestures of American Sign Language, signing the word catalog, thus completing the phrase catalog raisonné. It's almost as if he's translating it, uh, um, um, a, a translation is occurring uh, from, from a seemingly foreign language for the viewer. The hand gestures did not match the numerical uh, value when used in his 2012 monoprint series seen a few minutes ago. Sign language also appears in a few other works in the last several years, such as the untitled 2013 offset lithograph for Art in America. So if you subscribed to Art in America in 2013, um, or you still have those copies, you should go back because there is one of John's prints that he made for that. I subscribed and got it. <laughs> Sign language takes center stage in his fragment of a letter from 2010 that is on view in the exhibition. In this diptych, Jasper Johns appropriates hand signs as a malleable vocabulary that defies straightforward meaning while retaining their use as markers of communication. He places uh, an American Sign Language translation of a letter from Vincent van Gogh to his friend, the artist Emil Bernard, on the left, with the printed text on the right. It presents a sort of visual puzzle. The alternate alphabet is also a reworking of John's recurring handprint. In the catalog Raisonné series, uh, he placed string on each plate, playfully arranging it in maraud ways. Uh, he would ink the cord, printing it in black, while other times laying it on the surface as it embosses the sheet of paper and remains white. In 1996, John began to use uh, a string hanging from the upper right to lower left, generating a curve called a catenary. 
It was a compositional device in a series of paintings, drawings, and as seen here, a monoprint series from 2001. Often the catenary string implies spatial depth and produces a shadow as it suspends from two points. He abandons this purpose in the 100 monoprint series as the string becomes untethered, as sinuous curves, straight lines, and tangles, uniting or segmenting the diverse objects on the sheet. The leaves collected from the artist's property dominate each monoprint in the series. Oak, maple, locust, and catalpa leaves take on varied positions and combinations. Besides the 1998 untitled monoprint seen earlier, leaves do not appear any other time in the artist's oeuvre until this catalog raisonné series from 2015. They are inherently two-sided printing matrices and reference the actual leaves of the catalog raisonné. The leaves are symbolic of change, renewal, and John stated that, what is actually interesting to me is the fact that it isn't designed, but taken. In the catalog raisonné series, he was determined not to repeat himself. As Richard Field commented about John's work, no meanings are privileged, no intentions are ever quite prior, no processes can be carried out without in invoking their contradictions, and no images exist independent independently of their forebearers and followers. We, as viewers, are allowed into John's thought process as he transfers, repeats, moves, reverses, layers, cuts up, and even obscures in 100 variations on a theme. Thank you.